today on Family Talk. Welcome everyone to this edition of Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I hope you know how much we appreciate your listening along with us for your constant prayers and your support. Each day, we should be thankful to be an American. At least that's the way I feel about it from deep within my soul. The opportunities, the freedoms, and blessings of this nation are unmatched throughout the world, and I might even say throughout the history of the world. Unfortunately, today, the liberties that our founders ensured for us are under siege from a progressive culture, a leftist culture. You and I have a responsibility to protect this nation's Christian heritage and to stand for morality and decency and biblical truth. In a moment, we're going to conclude the presentation that we began yesterday on the topic of defending those religious liberties. Our guest then, and again today, was Dr. Jay Sekulow. In case you missed the first part of that message, here's a piece of what we heard from last time. In God we trust. Not in government, not in programs. Our founders had a very unique understanding that liberty and freedom were not the grace of government, but a gift from the Creator. That's why we are endowed with these inalienable rights. And that's why when you go through the Statue of Liberty, and you see that beacon of freedom, and I think about it, my grandfather came to the United States at 14 for freedom. And here we are today, and we're still fighting for freedom. When you... When you think about the majesty of America and the wonder of America, that's the reason. You can probably hear the passion in Jay's voice for preserving our First Amendment rights. Today, Dr. Sekulow continues to review some of the key religious freedom lawsuits that he's argued. He also challenges believers to consistently petition God for justice and protection. Before we hear the rest of this message, let me tell you more about our guest. Dr. Jay Sekulow is a seasoned attorney, a New York Times bestselling author, and a prominent speaker. He also serves as the chief counsel for the American Center for Law and Justice. Dr. Sekulow is an expert in defending religious freedoms, which you will certainly recognize through this presentation. Here again is Dr. Jay Sekulow, on this edition of Family Talk. I was at a conference at a well-known university, William and & Mary, and there was a Supreme Court conference, and I was one of the panelists, speakers, and we're sitting around the table before, and it was all the Supreme Court reporters are there, and you're having dinner, and, and the Chancellor University's there, and the primary architect of the whole same-sex marriage debate for the gay and lesbian groups was there as well. And we're sitting at the table, and she said to me, you know, I have a question I've always wanted to ask you. And I, folks, I will never forget this. I've always wanted to ask you this. And everybody there, I'm sure, was thinking it was going to be some grand discussion about the Constitution, some grand discussion about the issue of marriage or church-state separation. She goes, well, there's one question I've always wanted to ask you. I've known you for a long time. She goes, you know, you and I were born in the same town, Brooklyn, New York. We grew up in the same neighborhood in Long Island lived a couple of exits apart. How did you end up believing in Jesus? That was the question. Do you want an answer? That was the question I was delighted to answer. I had this experience also. Let me tell you this. Now, let me, let me tell you this. I was asked to speak at a, and this is where God utilizes the media sometimes when they don't even realize they're being utilized. I was asked to speak at a conference from the uh, Reform Jewish Congregation's Social Policy Committee. And uh, the rabbi asked me to, give a, to participate in a debate. He said, one condition, no proselytizing. I said, this is your territory. Absolutely, I'm not going to do that. I hate that word proselytizing, by the way. What all it means is evangelism, but it's, just, it's, it's such a negative connotation. But I didn't react to it. I said, this will be a good opportunity. It was supposed to be on church state separation and prayer in school and these kind of issues. He goes, but no Jews, Jesus, no. I said, okay. Front page of the New York Times that very day. Front page of the New York Times. 
above the fold. Profile on me, and believe me, most of it is about the Jewish kid from Brooklyn, the lawyer at the Supreme Court who believes in Jesus. So we do the debate, and then it's time. And these are with his major donors, the major donors for this organization. And it's time for questions and answers. And do you think anybody had a question about can Mary Sue have the Bible study? Nope. First question. Guy comes up. I can picture this to this day, sitting in the back row. Has the New York Times. He said, you want to tell me about this? I said, Rabbi, I told the rabbi I would not. They started booing. And I, I spoke for about an hour. I never proselytized. I just answered questions. <laughs> if it wasn't for that New York Times article, I don't think there would have been a question asked. That's the truth about that. So you don't know how God's going to utilize these things to impact the culture. Now, I mentioned these key cases we've been involved in, and there's been some great ones. But let me tell you another one I did. And it was probably the most difficult, gut-wrenching case I've ever been involved in in my life. And we've not talked about this much, and this will be the first time we've really talked about it. We've given snippets of this, but it's well settled now. We had a call from a ministry in Kentucky, and they had contact with a Palestinian Christian woman in Gaza. And she was under distress because, you see, her husband ran the Christian bookstore in Gaza for the Palestinian Bible Society. And he was assassinated in broad daylight. There are kids here, so I'm not going to say the extent of it, but let me tell you, brutal. He had three children of his own, one of which he never saw because his wife was pregnant. And that was bad enough. He was assassinated for being a Christian and running the Bible bookstore. But then the local sheik, the Islamic cleric, demanded custody of her children because he was worried about those kids, and she knew she had to get out. There was only one problem. She was in Gaza, and to get out to where she needed to go, she had to go through Israel. And there was about to be a war. And we began working on this about December 19th of last year. And on the day before Christmas, we received a call from high-ranking Israeli government officials that said, you need to get on a plane and bring your team, and you need to be here. I landed at the Ben Gurion Airport, and I looked up in the terminal, and CNN was playing it, and a war had broken out in Gaza, and we just landed in Tel Aviv on our way to Gaza in that area. And we had to extract her out of Gaza into her safe zone. And you talk about miraculous groups and groups and groups try to get her out. We utilize every legal, diplomatic, political, spiritual avenue we had. The area, and we've got this on video, the area that you go through the Ezra crossing, Eretz crossing, that's where you go through between Gaza and Israel. They weren't letting her out. They weren't letting anybody out. There was a war going on. I mean, I was watching the war. Government officials from Israel said, there'll be a particular time. She needs to be there at that time. Don't be there 15 minutes early, and don't be there 15 minutes late. She'd already been there once, and they wouldn't let her through, and she wasn't really thrilled about getting back. It was a two-hour trek to get there while a war was going on. And all I will tell you is that the crossing situation was no longer an obstacle for her to get through. And out she went. So when I get criticized by the left on you don't understand the plight of the Palestinians, I said, you know, that's really easy for you to talk about in Kansas or in Washington. I represent them. I was there when it happened. I have it recorded. I saw what God could do if we become vessels for his service. Because I will tell you something, folks. If you would have told me some Jewish Christian from Brooklyn would be on the border of Gaza and Israel on a mountaintop 
watching the rockets come in and the rockets go over my head and interviewing Shimon Perez and Benjamin Netanyahu in bomb bunkers because they were actually incoming. I would have never believed it. We were able to capture that on video. We've distributed 75,000 of these DVDs. We've aired only snippets on TV for other reasons. But this is the reality of the global struggle we're in. This was a victory for Jesus Christ. It was a victory for that family. Sure, it was a victory for the lawyers that worked the case for our team. You talk about stress level, that's stress, but it isn't the stress that she went through, and that's what I remind myself. The opportunity is laid before you. And in a sense, it's really laid before all of us. And for those that are watching by television or watching this on our television broadcast, this is an opportunity we all have to show the stamina, the perseverance, and the desire to make sure that this message of hope is communicated globally. I'm not a theologian. I'm a lawyer. I've always been fascinated by theology, and a lot of great theologians were lawyers. I'm a good lawyer. I'm not a theologian, but I do know this. When I read the Scriptures, and particularly one parable, Luke 18, the parable of the unjust judge. Now, we may have some judges here. I will tell you, I have been before a few unjust judges in my day. You know, in a case not too far down the road from you in Wichita, I had the opportunity to defend the Summer of Mercy many years ago for Operation Rescue. I was asked to do Barbara Walters broadcast that very night. I was supposed to be inside a nice air-conditioned studio on the 104-degree Wichita night that it was in July or August of that year, and I ended up in front of the abortion clinic. That's where the driver and their security detail for ABC took me. And they wanted me to go live against Lawrence Tribe, who was in the nice air-conditioned studio, the Harvard Law Professor in Boston. And I'm going to be in front of the abortion clinic at 104 degrees with 20,000 pro-lifers behind me. And there was a third guest. And they didn't tell me who that third guest was going to be. In fact, they didn't tell me there was going to be a third guest, but there was a third guest. And as I put the headset on and got mic'd up and had the debate with Lawrence Tribe, it went pretty well, I thought, actually. I knew my case. I knew I was going before the judge tomorrow. I was ready. This was good prep, except for one problem. The third guest was the judge that I was going to be before the next day. Instead of being the umpire, he became the cheerleader for the other side. That's when, despite the fact that I lived in Atlanta since I was 15 years old, the Brooklyn in me came right back. And right back the next day in that courtroom, too. The judge said on national TV, I have instructed this lawyer, Jay Seculo, to tell his client to not violate my order. And he refuses to. I said, Judge, that's not correct. I told my client what your order is. I told my client that if they violate it, there's consequences. I'm an officer of the court. I am not my client's conscience. I am their lawyer. If they're going to violate your order, I'll defend them aggressively against your order. But I said, Judge, you're supposed to be the umpire. The next day we're in court. My law partner tells me, who's been practicing law about 10 years longer than me, but we've tried hundreds of cases together. He said, you got a tough, <laughs> we got to be really careful here. This judge is angry, and he is angry at you, my friend, and you are the lead lawyer on this. The clerk of the court, when we get in there, says the judge would like to see counsel in chambers. And I went, oh, here it goes. By the way, he was famous for saying this great line. Logan has it on this DVD they're working on, this movie they're working on right now. And he told the protesters that if they violate his order, bring their toothbrush because they're going to be in jail right through Christmas. So Monaghan tells me, he goes, did you bring your toothbrush? Because I, this judge is angry. We get back into the chamber. where the judge bolts up from under his, he was sitting on his desk, had his feet up on his uh, desk, bolts up from the desk, gives me this bear hug. It's a secular we made history last night. <laughs> I said, indeed we did, judge. But I got to do something. I said, judge, I don't want to do this in open court. But you know what? You're no longer the umpire. You're the manager of this team. And you can't be the judge in this case. 
you've got to recuse yourself and let another judge sit in the rest of this trial. He was angry. And he said, your motion is denied. And I mean, this Brooklyn Jewish kid, I was a lot younger then, marched right up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. And I filed that order. And I'm telling you, 48 hours later, that judge was off the case. Rude, aggressive, and obnoxious. Rude, aggressive, and obnoxious? Probably. Probably. But when your client's getting battered, what is the role of the advocate? Now, we have an advocate, an advocate far greater in Jesus Christ. Luke 18, the parable of the unjust judge. As I said, I've been before a few of those. But what happens in that parable is there's this woman that wanted justice as she was a widow. And she wanted justice so badly that she went to the house of a judge and she knocked on the door of that house. But you see, the judge, he didn't fear God, he didn't fear man, and he didn't fear this woman. And what did she do? She knocked. The judge, he didn't fear God, he didn't fear man. This woman could knock all night. She did. By the way, this woman could have been my mother centuries back. <laughs> his, his Jewish mothers are pretty intense in a good way. And she knocked. You know that judge? He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. This woman was driving him nuts. I told you I was not a theologian. That's my version of it. But what happened? He opened the door and she got justice. And what does Jesus say? How much more will our Father do for us if we continue to petition Him? Let me urge you, let me implore you, let me encourage you to petition God for righteousness, for justice, for freedom, to proclaim and defend the message of hope. We need to do this because we do live in the land of the free. We're the home of the brave, and we've seen that in ways we didn't imagine we would have to, right here on our shores. Again. Again. And I pray that the president will ultimately say that. We have been attacked again. And when he does say that, and I encourage him and pray that he does, the reality of what we're dealing with will be borne out. And I will tell you this, and I will tell you this with humility and with respect. As we struggle for righteousness, as we knock on the door for justice, don't forget that we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the King we serve. I want to leave you with two statements, and then I want to pray. First, we've got a challenge ahead too. We're battling at the United Nations, the organization of the Islamic Conference. They are the largest body inside of the UN, 57 member countries. They're trying to get this defamation of religion issue. You may have heard me talking about this. We opened up an office, we, our European office is a, a non-governmental organization with the United Nations. We are two blocks away from the UN in New York City. It's amazing how it comes right back around. And there we are again, right back in New York. My father said he worked really hard for us not to have to be in New York anymore, and there we are, right back. I got criticized by a group saying, well, I can't stand the UN, why are you there? Why am I there? It's a battleground. You only get in trouble when you don't report for duty. I'm not saying we're not going to get shot at. I'm not going to say the slings and arrows. We're going to be there. You know, they denied our application twice to be part of the UN. And I had our lawyers from France do it because they're European. It was the whole European thing. And then it was time for the Brooklyn again because twice we were denied. They denied us and the Jewish National Fund. So I went up to the Secretary General of that, not of the whole UN, of the NGO committee because they had this hearing in the, 
in the big room you're used to seeing on TV. And I said, you know, it's an interesting thing that there were two groups denied uh, in the UN uh, admission. Uh, the Jewish National Fund and an organization headed up by a Jewish Christian. And you're letting groups that are promoting pedophilia? So here's the deal, UN. You could deny our application, and trust me, with our media outlets, we will be your worst nightmare. Or you can admit us, and we'll continue to be a nightmare, but it won't be as bad. And that sounds very threatening, but you know what? It's the reality of utilizing the ability and the gifts and the resources that God's given us to push back. So the pushback then becomes, and I didn't even know this was an issue when we applied for that UN membership, Pastor. I did not know that the Organization of the Islamic Conference was going to try to criminalize the proclamation of the gospel globally, which is what they're trying to do. But I want to tell you something. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, sent a strong, I'm going to tell you, I told you this before when we were in a private meeting, message that he wasn't going to tolerate that defamation of religion. And Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, was strong. And you know what? That made my job easier. So despite political this and political that, you don't know what God will use in a particular circumstance for your benefit. Now, I could flip that very easy on the health care issue. I will not get into that tonight. I will just tell you that same enthusiasm I had for the current administration as it relates to the defamation of religion in the Organization of the Islamic Conference, I do not share on the health care issue. That's just, no, 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 that's just, that's real. Although we did get the pro-life amendment in, and that was a, a major accomplishment. I hope we can defeat the big, and by the way, by the way, Pastor, let me tell you this. We could not have done it without the media. We garnered almost 200,000 signatures from you on radio and TV and blitzed the House of Representatives. And the end result was, not only does that amendment pass, it passes with an incredible margin, including 70 Democrats voting for the pro-life amendment. God allowed us to utilize our resources in the media, combining it with our legal capabilities, and we got a great result. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to pray. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful at this church, but I want you to tap along with me as I pray. And then your pastor's going to come up for a few closing words. So you start tapping, and I'm going to start praying. Father, we come before you as your people, and we thank you for calling us into your kingdom for service. And Father, we want justice and righteousness and liberty. And we pray for our veterans and for those that lost their life even this past week in service to our country right here at home. Not for your pastor's glory, not for this lawyer's glory, but for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What a riveting end to today's Family Talk broadcast featuring Dr. Jay Sekulow from the American Center for Law and Justice. We must actively and continuously petition God for his protection and to act justly on our behalf. I really hope you've enjoyed this two-day program on protecting our Christian values and American liberties. Visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org for more information about the American Center for Law and Justice. Once you're there, you'll also find additional information about Dr. Jay Sekulow and his best-selling books. You'll find all this and much, much more when you visit drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the broadcast page. While you're on our site, be sure you also check out our Station Finder feature as well. Now, this tool allows you to see when Family Talk is airing across our immense radio network. Just click on the broadcast menu, then drop down to the Family Talk Radio Stations button. There you'll see our entire radio network on an easy-to-use and interactive map. Tap on your home state to see when and where you can listen to Dr. Dobson. You'll find all that when you take advantage of the Radio Station Finder feature when you visit drjamesdobson.org. We welcome your responses and your thoughts on these past couple of programs here on Family Talk featuring Jay Sekula. You can visit Family Talk's Facebook page and leave your comments on today's broadcast post there. Uh, let us know what you learned or appreciated from this full presentation. Also feel free to share our post with your loved ones so they can enjoy it as well. Go now to Family Talk's Facebook page and comment on today's broadcast post. That's facebook.com forward slash Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Finally, as we conclude today's edition of Family Talk, won't you consider making a donation to the James Dobson Family Institute? Our ministry is entirely listener-supported, and we rely on God through your generous financial contributions to keep going. The summer months are tough for every nonprofit, and we are no exception. So if you would like to partner with us, simply visit drjamesdobson.org for more information on how you can make a donation. That's drjamesdobson.org. Or you can call us toll-free at 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. Thanks so much for your continued support and also your prayers for Dr. Dobson and the ministry altogether. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for joining us and have a blessed day. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.